So we're looking at the topic of current world events in the light of Bible prophecy. And we actually read just now one of the prophecies of the Bible. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, it's got, as you can see there in Luke 21, um, it's got some really interesting imagery and ideas that have been put forward. Uh, all kinds of events are happening. And we'll look at a couple of those and what they meant for the people of the day and also what they mean for, for us in our day today as well. But before we start, let's just, I suppose, have a quick think about well, how do we want to approach this, this topic. And here's a rough agenda of what we'll go through this afternoon. First of all, um, it's the Christadelphians who are putting on this event. Um, so, so who are we and, and what is our approach to the Bible? Because if you come here to um, have a look at current events in the light of Bible prophecy, you'll obviously want to know, well, how are we interpreting the Bible? Uh, what's our approach when we open a Bible prophecy? Um, and is it just Bible prophecies we, we take a, a, as being God's word, or is it our own prophecies or thoughts as well? Um, we also want to look then, I suppose, at uh, what actually is Bible prophecy made up of, um, what kind of messages were given to people uh, in ancient times, and also for us today. We'll look then around us in the world and say, well, what, what's happening in the world around us? Um, uh, and how does that match up with what God has described is likely to take place? Um, and then the question, I suppose, is, well, what does that mean for us? Where do we fit into the, to the Bible timeline? Is there a timeline uh, that God is working to? And what's coming up in the future as well, which is really interesting. So looking forward to talking about that in a minute. And then I suppose just to finish up, well, what are some further steps from here? Um, we're assuming that uh, you've come along because you're interested in this topic. Um, there's lots of other information that we'll be able to share that's probably not going to be covered off this afternoon. <laughs> we can't fit too much into a, a half an hour or 40 minutes. So uh, where do we go from here? And how do we find out more about this topic? Well, I suppose just to start with, I come over to, in the New Testament, to the second book of Timothy and chapter two, who finds some really interesting words by the Apostle Paul. He was writing to the young man, Timothy, uh, in the first century Ecclesia days, and he was encouraging him to really carefully study his word properly, because there were lots of errors and lots of other ideas that were, were floating around the, the, um, the church at, at those times, and it was very important that he studied the Bible carefully. So this, I suppose, will start to give you, we'll look at a few quotes and we'll, it will tease out, I suppose, how we think God really wants us to approach and understand our Bible. Because this is really important when we come to look at Bible prophecy. And in 2 Timothy 2 in verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, he says, study, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or carefully dissecting the word of truth. So the way the Apostle Paul thought about the Bible was it's the word of truth. It's come from God, and we need to be very careful in how we go about and, and have a look at it. In fact, there was a fantastic example in the first century, um, first, back in the first century, of believers who heard the apostles uh, speaking about uh, what, what was happening in their day. And even though the apostles themselves were giving that message out, they then went back and carefully checked to see if those words were true. Come over to Acts 17. And here we find an interesting group of people called the Bereans who carefully examined whether or not even the apostles of the Lord Jesus were actually saying things that lined up with the rest of the Bible and the rest of what God uh, would want them to, to, to know. Acts 17 and verse uh, verse 10 and 11, it's, we're here just reading about uh, Paul and Silas, two of the faithful apostles and their, and their journeys. And it says, The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into, unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they, it says that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They were very keen to understand what they had to say. And they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So even though an apostle would come to them and said, actually, look, this is the truth of the matter. You should really believe this. They said, okay, great. Really keen to take that on board. Let me just go and check with my Bible to make sure that's correct. And it says, therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. So that's a, a wonderful example, isn't it? So that's, I suppose, starts to give you a bit of a feel for how Christadelphians um, take the Bible and our approach to it. We believe the Bible is wholly inspired as well and without error. So um, except for perhaps in translation. If, if you come over to 2 Peter 1, also in the New Testament, towards the end of the Bible, the second book of Peter and chapter 1 and verse uh, 19, it talks here about the, uh, the uh, how people wrote the Bible. And it says there in 2 Peter 1 and verse 19, Peter says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He's writing about all the different things they would have heard in their day. And he says, this word of prophecy that you've got in your, in your, in your lap, the Bible, he said, it's, it's a more sure word. He says, he says, whereunto you do well that you take heed. It's like, he says, a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise. So there's lots of things and lots of information we could know. 
But this, this word of, of the Bible and the prophecies that would be given are like a light shining in that dark place. It tells us something. It illuminates things for us. And he says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So this doesn't come just because it's the, the will that someone was particularly thinking or they thought, actually, this is what I think it's saying. I'll write this down and look, this is now gospel truth. No, he says it's not up to them personally to do it. He says, verse 21, the prophecies came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't up to them as to what they wrote in the Bible. He says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved along or driven along by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to believe that God was very specific in what he got people to write down and to include in his word, the Bible. And because of that approach that's happened, we can then can have a lot more uh, reassurance and comfort in the, the accuracy of the word of God. And we believe that the Holy Bible is the, the word of God, the actual word of, of, of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Um, we won't turn up, but that quote, First Thessalonians 2, verse 13, talks about um, some wonderful believers who, it says they received the Bible not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So we take this very seriously. And we, we look to the Bible alone. So I suppose we should say, before we get too far into the talk, that when we come to a Bible prophecy, it is actually literally that, just prophecies from the Bible. Uh, we don't make any uh, prophecies of our own. We don't uh, have any, I suppose, any other divine inspiration. We don't believe there is any other divine inspiration apart from what you find in the Bible. And from there, we take the lessons for our life and what, what we think God's purpose and plan is. Uh, we take the Bible literally also. So when we come to look at some of the prophecies, uh, you'll see that we're, we're reading them, and what it says, says there quite specifically is what we take as being the truth of the matter, except for where it's very figuratively. If it's talking about um, there being signs in the sun, moon, and stars, then that will most likely be relating to a figure of speech, talking about the ruling powers of the day. Um, if it's allegorical, if it's poetic, um, or those things, aside from that, we take the Bible very literally. In fact, that's how Jesus took the Bible. If you look at that quote, we won't turn it up, but afterwards, perhaps, if you see me for a copy of the slides, that uh, quote, Luke 10, verse 26, Jesus turned to the people around him and said to them, how readest thou? He expected them to know the Old Testament scriptures and to see the way in which they were looking at them. In Romans 4 and verse 3, uh, the apostle Paul is writing and he says, but what saith the scripture? He's quoting and looking back at the Old Testament. So we take these words very literally. And we look to the Bible for guidance then on how to be like God and, and how to change our behavior accordingly. So we'll learn things through these uh, prophecies. Even today, we'll learn some things uh, as we go through and look at these prophecies. But the question then is, well, what are we going to do with that information? Uh, are we going to then just see that as an interesting fact to learn? Well, Christadelphians, uh, as Bible students, then take that on board and say, well, this is how then I need to evaluate a change and live, live my life accordingly. So it's very important that we respond to the word of God. So that gives you a very quick overview um, of how important we take uh, the Bible. And that affects our approach to Bible prophecy. Because when you start to then look at uh, prophecies you come across in the Bible, uh, we, we believe they are messages from God to us to, to then uh, decipher, to work out, and then to think about how that affects us or the people of that generation. Come back to Deuteronomy 18. And here we find God talking about uh, the giving of prophecies. Because you want to say, well, what actually is Bible prophecy? Is it a, you know, when I first thought of the concept of prophecies and, you know, is it something to do with uh, someone mumbling over some, some, you know, something they've imagined? Is it like Indiana Jones and like an ancient prophecy that was written on the back of, of this stone or something? I mean, what are prophecies? Well, prophecies are quite specific. Um, if you come to Deuteronomy 18, it's actually quite a simple thing. They're messages from God to us and they're quite specific. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18 to 20. This is in the law of Moses now, and, and Moses is writing down the, the words uh, that God has said to him. And he says, in verse 17, and the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So when there's a prophet coming from God, the prophet is not left to his own devices to say what he thinks about this particular topic or uh, what he thinks might come up and, and, and whether he is or isn't an optimistic or pessimistic person that that might come into the equation. It doesn't. God's very specific about how he gives a prophecy. He says he's going to put his words, God's words, into his mouth and he's going to speak unto them all that I command him. So when we read a Bible prophecy, they're the exact words that God wants us to know and to think about. Suddenly you realize that this is very specific. Um, and verse 19, uh, he goes on to say, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken 
unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So when we hear a prophet speaking and we hear the words of God, then God is expecting us to be aware of those words and to respond to them. And if not, well, then God will require it of us. But he says in verse 20, the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. It's very serious, isn't it? <laughs> um, it goes to show you that if, the, if you're putting out words, saying that they're going to be words from God and a message for us, then that's not something to be taken lightly. Uh, we take the words of God very seriously. They are his words. Um, but no one, no, certainly no Christophian, and no one should go around suggesting there's a prophecy from God that isn't something that actually has come from God himself. As you can see there, there's a response that's required. So already we can see from one quote that um, God's messages to the people are very specific. They warn people of things to come. And we'll find throughout the Bible there's prophecies um, of good things uh, to come and prophecies of bad things. There's prophecies that are both foretelling, talking about the future. Uh, for example, there's prophecies back here in the early part of the Bible that talk about things that are going to happen in our day, uh, which is thousands of years later. And there's also um, prophecies and words which God speaks to the people, which are going to happen for them the next day or, or a couple of weeks afterwards. Now, coming over to Second Chronicles 36, here's an interesting point to note about Bible prophecy, and that is that Bible prophecy is uh, a way of God caring for us, a caring for the people that were there in those days, uh, because God sent his prophets to warn people so they could respond, and there was an opportunity for them to, to be aware of, of his purpose and his plan. Second of Chronicles 36 and verse uh, 14. It's reading, uh, reading here at the end of the book of Chronicles, and it's looking back across the history of all the king, the time period of the kings of Israel, um, which is about uh, 1,500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. It says here in verse 14, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen, the nations round about, and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. So these messengers were coming regularly from God, talking to the people, trying to get them to change their ways because he had compassion. This is why he sent them the prophets. But what was their approach? Well, they mocked the messengers of God. They despised, they ridiculed his words, his prophecies. And they misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. So you can see how this builds on the previous quote we looked at, where back in Deuteronomy, it was saying it's very important that we respond in the right way um, and we take this seriously. And after hundreds of years of Israel's history, it's clear the nation weren't responding, even though God was time and again sending his prophets to speak to them. And so there was going to come judgment upon his people. Another thing about Bible prophecy is that the prophets who gave it were they searched diligently to understand God's message. We don't have the time to look at those quotes, but we can go through and have a look at the way in which the prophets really wanted to understand the words that they were saying um, because they were God's words, not their words themselves. And Bible's prophecy is God's care for us. Here's two quotes I've got up there on the screen. Um, from Romans 15, the Apostle Paul writing, he says, he says, whatsoever things were written aforetime or before now, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So there's a hope and a level of comfort we can get by understanding the plan of, and message of God. Um, and it's for our learning. It's for us to do something with it. And Amos 3, this is a great quote from Amos 3 verse 7. I love this quote because it gives us a real sense of reassurance. It says there, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but in other words, God won't do anything except for the fact, first of all, he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So that helps us to understand that if there's a plan and purpose uh, with this earth, with us, um, with you who are listening, then it must be here in Scripture, which is pretty exciting because then we need to start going looking for it and saying, well, where is this and, and how can I be a part of it? And, and what is there that God's going to do? Because um, surely he says he's revealed it to us and we know that he doesn't lie. So that's the key principle, I suppose. God doesn't leave uh, the faithful in, in the dark. If you really want to understand God's plan and purpose of the earth, you can by going to the Bible. So here's a couple of examples. Um, just before we look at, I suppose, the current events and things that are happening around us, here's a, here's a few minutes just looking at a couple of quick examples of Bible prophecies and then how they've come to pass. And we can see the, the incredible accuracy that's happened um, 
over the years that have gone by. So this first example, one we know quite well, a lot of the world would have been thinking about it, perhaps briefly, uh, at the Christmas time just recently. But there's many prophecies all throughout the Old Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming. The fact that he was going to be born, the fact that he was going to be a descendant of King David, for example, and continue the kingly line. The fact that he was going to be uh, born in Bethlehem, and many people would know that fact, for example. That was prophesied back in a, a small prophet called Micah, and that's back at the end of the Old Testament. Um, and that happened, I don't know, five, six hundred years before the Lord Jesus Christ actually was born. And that prophecy came to pass exactly as was prophesied. Uh, you may know the prophecy about Jesus being betrayed by a friend, Judas. That was prophesied by the words of King David, who was a prophet. We know that from Acts 3. Um, back in Psalm 41, um, that was prophesied of. Uh, we, we know about the, the prophecy that was, he was going to be valued at 30 pieces of silver. His hands and feet were going to be pierced. That was, that was prophesied of back in Psalm 22 by David once again. Um, and then also by David, it was prophesied that he was going to be raised from the dead. And there's many other things as well. And this was, a, this was a pivotal moment in history when the Lord Jesus Christ came and when, and when God's plan of reconciliation that he had was fulfilled and a way of salvation was made open for all of us, which we all can take part in. Um, and that's, I suppose, why we're coming here to, to understand and to look at the scriptures. But that pivotal moment, because it was so big and important, it was part of God's plan and purpose. And so that was prophesied of a thousand years or more, 2000 years before he, um, before he came. And when we look down at those things and we can see all of the different prophecies that came to pass, we then start to get to think about, well, actually, this is quite accurate. It's not just a, a murky vision of you know, almost like a horoscope of this year, someone will feel bad about you. Like, it, it's quite specific and detailed. They were going to, each of those things were going to take place and they came to pass with stunning accuracy. And this then gives me and I hope it gives you as well faith in God's word that other prophecies will come to pass as well. Here's, here's another example of a Bible prophecy. And it's one we read about um, this afternoon. Uh, in AD 70, um, there was a, an incredible destruction that took place of the state of Israel and Jerusalem in particular. The city was ransacked, the temple was destroyed, and not long after, the people, uh, uh, a number of years later, the people themselves were then scattered and taken throughout the Roman Empire. What's fascinating about this prophecy is that thousands of years before, this had been prophesied of in Deuteronomy 28. In fact, if we just quickly flick back there, I'll just show you this uh, a couple of words quickly. So Deuteronomy 38, sorry, 28, uh, it's a, a wonderful chapter by Moses where he talks about all the incredible blessings that will come upon uh, the children of Israel if they uh, hear, heard the words of God and they obeyed his voice. But then it also has a whole lot of warnings that, about what would happen if they turned away from observing his commandments and didn't hearken to what he had to say and the curses that would come upon them. And, and in that, included amongst the things that were going to happen because God knew this was going to happen. In verse uh, 48 it says thou shalt serve thine enemies which Yahweh shall send against thee in hunger and thirst and nakedness and want of all things and God shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as it was back then uh, the Roman uh, the Romans coming against the uh, who were the ones who destroyed the temple in AD 70 they were from the end of the earth as far as the Jewish people were concerned as swift as the eagle flieth which was the the Roman standard a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to the young. And it goes on to talk about the incredibly difficult times and the seeds that was going to happen to that city as a result of what they'd done. Over to verse 64, it says, The Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. Uh, but it was going to be um, a terrible time for them for centuries and centuries. And if we come over to Luke 21, which we had read for us this evening, this is where we, we actually read about the Lord Jesus Christ is now talking in further detail about the, this event that was going to happen. And he goes into even more detail about actually what's going to happen to them in the lead up to the siege, because there's only about 40 years away uh, before that took place from the words of the Lord Jesus. And he talks about all the difficult times that are going to happen to them and he says to them in verse 24, he says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. He's echoing the same concepts of Jero 28. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so for thousands of years then, from 1870 right through to 1967, um, 
Jerusalem was going to be trodden down of the Gentiles until that age was over. And just like that, all the detail of those prophecies come to pass. And you can go there today. And that bottom photo on the right there is from myself, uh, looking at all the stones that have been uh, thrown down, just like Jesus had said would come to pass. Um, the prophecy coming to pass with stunning accuracy. So a couple of quick examples, but just goes to show you the detail that really is in there in the Bible. So when we go to look at current events and what's happening in the world around us, um, what are we looking for, um, I suppose? Um, and there's probably a number of things that we could look at to say, well, the Bible talks about our day. We'll come to that a little bit more in a minute. Um, the Bible talks about a lot of detail about what is going to happen around our day and also what's coming up. And so working back from that, we can build a picture of what we expect to have happen around us and what we should look for in, in the world and, and in the current events. So signs that we are living in the last days, these are things like Israel being back in their land. That was prophesied of back in Ezekiel 37 or 38. In fact, we could put a tick next to that one. That's already been done. That's already been fulfilled. And, and that, was, that was prophesied of, um, I'd say, oh, 700 years, 600 years before Christ uh, day. Then jump forward to so 2,600 years ago, that was prophesied of. And uh, lo and behold, in 1948, 1967, Israel was back in the land in the mountains of Israel, just like it was prophesied of, and in Jerusalem, their city. So that that first one's been done. Uh, we could look at we look for Israel being in control of Jerusalem, but it's still being a conflict zone. Um, that's something we'll quickly look at in a minute. You know, where my time's fast going. Um, increased natural disasters are something that the Bible talks about is going to happen. Distress and fear at the coming world events around us uh, are crying out for peace, but being unable to achieve it. Uh, we expect to see Europe being more and more unified. We expect to see uh, an increase in social problems, environmental abuse, and an increase in selfish materialism. And there's many other things we could list on there as well, but I'll just grab these ones to start with, and we'll pick a couple out and, and go through them quickly. So, for example, this first one, um, Israel being in conflict, uh, in control of Jerusalem, but still a place of conflict. Um, so if I quickly flip back to Zechariah, I'll just read you a few of the um, words of, the, of this prophecy that was given. And this prophecy is still not being fulfilled. So we're expecting this to, to happen. Zechariah 12 and verse Zechariah 12 and verse 2 says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. And they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And so that it started to happen. It is a burden of stone. It's something that just uh, is, is never resolved. Um, and also, he says there at the end of the verse that all the people of the earth are going to be gathered together against it. So that's a future element of this prophecy that hasn't yet been fulfilled. In fact, if we turn over to Zechariah 14, verse 1 to 3. It says that the day of the Lord is coming. When thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, and he says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, the house is wife, or the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So that's a future prophecy. That hasn't yet been fulfilled, which is really exciting because we can then say, this is coming up. We know that that's going to happen one day. And just as surely those other prophecies came to pass, so this one's going to happen too. So we work back from this and we say, well, we expect them to see Jerusalem to be a place of increasing frustration, a place where the world's going to eventually think, you know what, we've got to resolve this and we're going to uh, fix this. And we see this in the news around us. Here's a couple of examples I grabbed from uh, Twitter or from the news just recently. Um, in December 2022, they were talking about fears of a full-blown Israeli-Palestinian conflict growing after the bloodiest year since 2005. Um, or this one here in the UN Security Council saying his comments were um, by the special coordinator of the UN who's saying after decades of persistent violence, um, illegal settlement expansion, dormant negotiations and deepening occupation, the conflict is again reaching a boiling point. So this is a, a problem for the world that doesn't seem to go away and they can't seem to resolve it. So it's slowly but surely we expect to see a ra ratcheting up of the problem in this space. More and more frustration shown by Europe, particularly, and the rest of the world uh, towards Israel. So that's a current event that we can look around and say, actually, we, that makes sense. It's not a great thing. It's obviously, uh, and quite a few of these things are problems, but there's a reason also, I think, why they are problems. And we'll come to that in a moment. So that's a, a current event we see in the world around us. Another one is um, distress and fear at coming world events. Come over to Luke 21. You may be there already still. Luke 21 in verse uh, 25 and 26. And just as verse 24 has now 
um, been fulfilled, that prophecy has been fulfilled. The next part of the Lord's words, that the, the, going on to the next bit of this prophecy, is, I believe, happening right now in our day. He says, there shall be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars, and upon the earth, distress. That means anguish or anxiety of nations with perplexity. There's no way out here. There's a quandary. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And I think every year, more and more, I, I, I see this happening. Um, whether it's climate change, bushfires, floods, earthquakes, cyclones, drought or war. Uh, they're all happening in, with increasing frequency and speed. A, a right up here that I've got uh, 2022, a year when disasters compounded and cascaded. Um, it's so easy, as you know. You, you turn on the news. <laughs> Anyone's news feed will show information like this where you can see the disasters that are happening around the world. And it says a recent uh, research that was done showed that three, three in four across 19 countries view global climate change as a major threat to their country. This is people looking on in fear for those things which are coming on the earth. And so this, is, this prophecy is coming to pass right now and being fulfilled in our day. Another uh, prophecy that uh, was, was made is the fact that there'd be, people would be crying out for peace but being unable to achieve it. Uh, that we won't look at that first quote, the first of Thessalonians 5, but that talks about the fact that when the day of the Lord, when we're at the end, end times and the day of the Lord is soon to come, which we'll talk about in a moment, and when they're talking about peace and safety, that that's when destruction comes. And come if I could flip back to Joel 3, I'll just read a few of those words that uh, have been prophesied as going to happen. Joel 3 in verse, reading from verse uh, 1 and 2, this is a similar prophecy to what we read before uh, in Zechariah. And it says there, but for, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, so it's talking about our day. It's talking about 1948 when uh, Israel was back in the land. The captivity of Judah was brought back and Jerusalem as well in 1967. It then says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So God says, around that time or shortly after, there will be a point when I gather all the nations to Jerusalem. And verse 9, we can see what's going to happen when that, when that occurs. It says, proclaim you this among the Gentiles, sanctify or prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. And these words now in verse 10 are the opposite of, of what the UN has outside their headquarters. He says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. And so... It's no surprise then when we turn on the news and we see the amount of world wars that are happening around the world at this time. There's more than 20 significant wars happening at any one point in time around the world. In fact, there's hundreds of thousands of people being killed at the moment in Ethiopia and Sudan, far more than, by the way, than are happening in Ukraine, although we don't hear too much about it um, on, our, on our current media channels. But there's thousands of people dying around the world on a, on a regular basis due to war. Wars, from our perspective, don't often seem to happen. In fact, this one in Ukraine seems to have popped out out of nowhere. But that's because we're in Australia and we're quite removed from the disasters that are happening in the world. And 2022 was the year, as, as many politicians said and many journalists said, when the horror of war returned to Europe. Um, and you can see there on top right the uh, a stock load of all the, um, the missiles, empty missile um, casings that Ukraine is piling up to show what's happening in Russia. And that's just that, that, that battle there. And it's, it's conflict and the peace not being able to achieve in many ways, whether that's actually through war or it's actually through the parties not being able to see eye to eye. From Europe accusing the US of profiteering from the war. Um, Russia saying now they're not to blame for the conflict and, and it, on and on it goes. Just this morning, I, I uh, looked at my phone um, when, when I woke up and it talked about the conflicts that are happening in, or about to happen in Turkey, where, uh, as the journalist there suggests, uh, due to the internal problems in the economy of Turkey, uh, Erdogan's probably going to go to war with Greece or Syria um, and find some other reason to, um, to distract from the problems he's got uh, politically. So conflicts are only going to grow. It's no surprise. Uh, we can see that happening. God said, prepare war, wake up the mighty men. It's going to happen soon. Distressing news, but it's what the Bible is prophesying is going to happen. And we'll see why in a second. We don't have time to go into the detail of this one, but we do expect to see uh, Europe being unified. Now, they are currently to a certain extent. Uh, in fact, Daniel 2, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. The prophecy of Daniel 2 is really interesting, and that describes the European nations as actually being united in some way, but still being a little bit fractured and standing up as a group of kingdoms 
against God and God's true believers in the latter days. And the Catholic Church there is described as being the unifying element between these countries. Now, that's a fascinating prophecy. We'd love to go through in more detail. Uh, but we look at that and we look at what's happening in the world around us. And uh, on Twitter just the other day, the European Commission was celebrating 65 years of the Treaties of Rome when the European economic community took off and there was a closer cooperation in Europe. And then only, only two days ago, uh, Germany's um, the, the foreign minister in Germany is saying, well, actually, this is really inconvenient when the EU, EU decisions are being blocked by individual countries. So we should find a way so the EU can just make the decision sense. <laughs> so you can see a tighter growing a, a cooperation and a, a way for them to try to push their agenda uh, is going to be on the cards pretty soon. So Europe being unified is something we had expected to see for many years, and it's really come to pass. And another prophecy that we uh, have, have been expecting to see is an increase in social problems. In fact, back to Luke 21, um, and we find here again some, some words of warning by the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 34, he says, and this is, he's speaking to the believers now, he says, take heed to yourselves. He says, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with, with surfeiting or, or drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. And there's a number of uh, quotes in the New Testament particularly that talk about the latter days and the distressing state of the social and, uh, and environment uh, amongst, uh, amongst the nations. And we expect to see an increasing focus on debauchery, on drunkenness and the cares of this life amongst the nations around us. Whether it's looking for statistics on uh, the alcohol consumption increasing significantly in the world, or it's the extreme wealth inequality um, that, you know, for example, we enjoy in this country uh, as compared to other countries around the world, which then makes it so easy to uh, binge watch on Netflix or to worry about the cares of our own personal lives. And then with that comes the COVID-19 pandemic and the, and the significant increase in anxiety and depression worldwide and the conflict and violence that comes with that as well uh, when people are stuck at home. <laughs> so all those things that happen, um, the social problems of the world are only increasing more and more. And the Bible does say that that's going to happen. In fact, Jesus says, be, care, care that, be careful that doesn't, that doesn't happen to yourself. And so you might say that's a very quick, I suppose, run through with some of the things that are happening in the world around and, and what we're expecting to see. And so you might say, okay, well, great. Well, but why do we want to know this? Is it because we just want to be prepared for tomorrow? Um, or is there something specific coming soon that we want to prepare for? Why does the Bible outline all these events? Um, as occurring or is it talk about them as leading to something or what's the purpose of knowing all of these bible prophecies and i'll just leave you with this one point that probably the biggest prophecy of all that's happened in the bible and it occurs over and over again the most prophesied event of all is the fact that the lord jesus christ is going to come back to this world now we haven't got that in detail at all but i'll just briefly mention a few of those key points to you now and we'd love to talk to you about it afterwards but this has been prophesied right from the beginning of the Bible, right through to now. In fact, it was the original purpose and plan of God to have a beautiful garden in Eden uh, where his creation could enjoy it together. And through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a way for us all to be part of God's great plan and purpose in a beautiful world uh, in the future um, time to come. And this has been prophesied of that the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, that, that's the Lord Jesus Christ who's mentioned in Scripture himself, is actually going to come back to this world. Come over to Acts 3. Let's look at a couple of quick quotes that talk about this actually happening. So here's an exciting prophecy that's coming up uh, very soon. Acts 3, verse uh, 19. And this is um, Peter and John speaking to uh, all the people there on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And his message to them is, and it's the same message for us today, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be coming back to this world at a time when there'll be a restitution, a, a clearing up, a cleaning up, a wonderful replenishing and, and a new order of things. Um, that has been prophesied right from back in the very beginning. And it says we need to repent so that we could be there in that day to enjoy that incredible occasion. And the fact that this is going to happen was also uh, spoken about in, in Acts 1 verse 11, where to the apostles themselves, watching the Lord Jesus Christ go into heaven, uh, the angels of God said this to them. Verse 11, the angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So just in the same way as he bodily, physically went up into heaven, so he's going to come back. And that prophecy has not been fulfilled yet, which I'm really looking forward to. And when the Lord Jesus Christ does come back, the Bible goes on to talk about um, in some of these quotes uh, that God's kingdom is going to be set up on earth, that the reason the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth is he's going to judge the nations. There's going to be a, a worldwide reckoning. The nations are going to be taught about God's ways. The, as you can imagine, society will drastically improve as a result of that. Jesus is going to raise some of the dead through the process of the resurrection, which is really interesting, and is going to reward the faithful servants past and present with eternal life. So you can see why we're so interested in Bible prophecy. And that's, I suppose, what we wanted to share with you today. The fact that we are in a certain point in the Bible timeline, and we believe that that's just before the Lord Jesus Christ does come back. There aren't many prophecies to be fulfilled before that time. In fact, many of the, some of those quotes we briefly went to in Joel and Zechariah, it talks about Israel being back in the land, and then immediately talks about the fact that the nations are going to come up against Jerusalem, and we know that's when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. So there can't be much time. It's a wonderful time to look into Bible prophecy. We'd love to talk to you about it more. So a couple of further steps, um, just as we conclude now, that we'd encourage you to look at as you uh, go on this journey of looking to Bible prophecy. First of all, um, continue to pray for God to help you with understanding as you, as you start to search and try to work out his word and what he's trying to what he's trying to say to us. Come and chat to us as well. We'd love to, you've obviously found our, um, our our site where you can you can see this streaming. We have many uh, topics that we go through on, on Bible prophecies, uh, looking at Daniel 2, for example, which is very exciting. Um, or you could go to SalisburyChristadelphians.com to learn more about us and about what we believe as well. And we just encourage you in, 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 in completion, we encourage you to keep questioning and keep searching the Bible as you look through the Bible prophecies and compare them with what's happening around so that we know where we are um, in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ's return. Thanks.